Hello, and welcome to this introductory video on the topic of energy. In this video, I'm going to provide a somewhat of a definition of what energy is, a little bit of motivation of why you might want to think about energy, and then a bunch of examples of how energy can be used. So let's actually start with the motivation, which is that so far in our studies, we've figured out that we can think about Newton's laws, we can do kinematics as well, and those provide ways of predicting what's going to happen in a given situation. But we also encountered the idea of momentum, and we saw that that was also a very useful tool that allowed us to avoid some of the details of the actual forces and things like that, and provided a new means of studying and describing motion. And energy is going to provide yet another way to understand problems of mechanics and what's going on. So it's going to be a different perspective. So that might be why you care. But even more fundamentally, why you should care is because energy is this very fundamental basic need. We need energy in order to do basically anything that we, that we do. We need energy to move. We need energy to lift things, to deform things, to make sound, make light, generate heat. Any of these things and all of these things require energy in different forms, and they transform energy, in fact. So one thing that you'll hear often said is that energy is actually always conserved. And that's true. Okay, When you do something with energy, you either provide a different kind of energy to the object as a result of whatever you've done, or actually transformed into a great number of different types of energy. For instance, sliding a box across the floor generates friction, and that friction results in heating up both the floor and the box. So you generate heat by applying some effort, which comes from, ultimately, chemical potential energy stored inside your muscles. But in order to release that energy, you have to burn it. So not only are you actually providing a, a, a means to supply that force, but you're also generating heat within yourself by releasing that energy. And so mechanics needs to provide a way of distinguishing these many different types of energy and restricting it down to what we'll consider to be the useful forms of energy. So as we transform between things like heat, kinetic energy, and potential energy, which we'll talk about in a moment, we have to distinguish whether or not those energies are going to be useful. And what we mean by useful is that I can certainly transform, for instance, the energy stored in my muscles or in my fatty tissue by burning that energy and pushing something and generating friction, which generates heat. And therefore, I've ultimately transformed my energy into heat. But I can't reverse that. Heat is sort of a wasted end state energy. We can't get back from heat into at least what mechanics considers to be the useful energies. So mechanics makes this distinction. If you can reversibly transform between types, then those are going to be called the useful energy or mechanical energy of a system. If you cannot, then those are types of energies that we don't care about, at least from the standpoint of mechanics. We just call that lost energy from a system. So we're going to go ahead and look now at mechanical energy. And it comes in two basic types. The first is kinetic energy, and the second is potential energy. Now, kinetic energy is probably one you're familiar with. That's the energy of motion. And it just says, if I've got an object of mass m moving with some velocity v, then that has an energy of 1 half mv squared. And even though velocity is a vector, notice it comes in squared in the equation. What that means is, that we don't care about the direction. It can be any one of these directions. As long as the magnitude is v, all of those have the same kinetic energy. So what about potential energy? Potential energy is a little bit different, and it's very situation specific. Potential energy represents energy that you've somehow stored in a system. And it's very important to emphasize that. Normally, you're talking about energy stored in a system that doesn't really belong to any one object. And we'll see what I mean by that in a second. One obvious example of this is if instead of having this ball moving off in the vacuum of space, it's actually some height h above the ground. 
In this case, we know that gravity wants to pull this mass down. So there's the potential for this thing to move. So by having it this height above the ground, it must have some stored energy, ultimately, that it obtained when I first lifted the ball off the ground. So I lift it, which stores the energy, and now it's got some energy, which gives it the potential to move back down. And as we said, this is coming from the fact that gravity wants to pull it down, so not surprisingly, we'll call this energy gravitational potential energy. And it too has a very simple form. It is just m, the mass of the object, times g, the gravitational acceleration, times the height above the ground. And here I'll make clear what I was speaking about earlier, that this energy really is part of the system's energy. I need the mass and the Earth in order to have this gravitational potential energy. So it doesn't belong just to the mass, and it doesn't belong just to the Earth. It belongs to this particular uh, configuration of the mass and the Earth. Okay. Another example of how we can store energy is we can take a spring. And if we take this spring, which has some natural length L, and we start to compress it, then if it's compressed by an amount delta x from its normal length, it ends up having an energy stored because that spring well, has the potential and it wants to, in fact, return to its normal length. So that energy that is stored in there turns out to have this form, 1 half k delta x squared. k is a constant that depends on the spring itself. It's called the spring constant. And delta x is actually just the displacement from the normal length. That applies both to compression as well as, had we stretched it by an amount delta x, then that spring would have the same energy stored in it. Okay, and notice delta x comes in as squared, which is why compression and stretching are the same sort of energies, even though the motion that would result is going to be in different directions. Now there's one more way of storing energy. We'll talk about it really quickly, just for completeness, which is charges. And we're not going to be dealing with this in this unit, but we'll include it, as I say, for completeness. And that just says if I've got two charges, Q1 and Q2, and they're separated by some distance r, then I can write down an electric potential energy that goes as the product of those charges times yet another constant. This k is different. It's not the spring constant. And divided by the separation between those two charges. So there are many different forms of energy. Energy as a whole, is always conserved. But in terms of mechanics, we only care about the forms that we can readily convert between back and forth without any loss. We call those mechanical energy, and they take many different forms, as shown here.